Chapter Twelve of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight, by John Hay. Chapter Twelve: The Pomeroy Circular. Before the close of the year eighteen sixty-three, the public mind became greatly preoccupied with the subject of the next presidential election though the general drift of opinion was altogether in favor of entrusting to mr lincoln the continuation of the work which he had thus far so well conducted this feeling was by no means unanimous it will seem strange to future students of the events of this time that the opposition in the republican party to mr lincoln whose name will stand in history as the liberator of the slaves came almost entirely from the radical anti-slavery element the origins of this opposition have been so fully stated in other portions of this work that it is not worth while to set them forth at any length in this place they were principally the action of the president in regard to the administration of affairs in missouri the conflict between general fremont and the missouri conservatives and between general schofield and the missouri radicals the retention in command of various generals who from the radical point of view had no heart in the cause the deliberation with which the great anti-slavery acts of the president were performed and in general the dissatisfaction with the slow progress of the war of eager and ardent spirits imperfectly informed as to the processes of the government and the facts of the situation at the end of the year eighteen sixty three and the beginning of the following year all these elements of discord were seeking a rallying point this it was not easy to find every one sufficiently acquainted with practical politics to note the drift of public opinion saw the hopelessness of contending against the popularity of the president there was not a republican general in the field of sufficient prominence to be thought of who would give the least encouragement for the use of his name against mr lincoln in neither house of congress was there a statesman who would enter into such a contest and in the higher circles of the administration there was only one man so short-sighted as not to perceive the expediency of the president's renomination and the impossibility of preventing it mr chase alone had the indiscretion to encourage the overtures of the malcontents and the folly to imagine that he could lead them to success pure and disinterested as he was and devoted with all his energies and powers to the cause of the country he was always singularly ignorant of the current public thought and absolutely incapable of judging men in their true relations he was surrounded by sycophants who constantly assured him of his own strength with the people and who convinced him at last that all manifestations to the contrary were the result of mystifications set on foot by his enemies he regarded himself as the friend of mr lincoln to him and to others he made strong protestations of friendly feeling which he undoubtedly thought were sincere but he held so poor an opinion of the president's intellect and character in comparison with his own that he could not believe the people so blind as deliberately to prefer the president to himself in november eighteen sixty three he wrote to his son-in-law governor sprague if i were controlled by merely personal sentiments i should prefer the re-election of mr lincoln to that of any other man but i doubt the expediency of re-electing anybody and i think a man of different qualities from those the president has will be needed for the next four years of course he adds i am not anxious to be regarded as that man and i am quite willing to leave that question to the decision of those who agree in thinking that some such man should be chosen to another he wrote early in december i have not the slightest wish to press any claims upon the considerations of friends or the public there is certainly a purpose however to use my name and i do not feel bound to object to it he never admitted to himself that he had any personal desire for the place and in this letter he continued were the post in which these friends desire to place me as low as it is high i should feel bound to render in it all the service possible to our common country yet he always felt that he could render better service in the higher places than in the lower and when it was once in contemplation to offer him a seat on the supreme bench he distinctly intimated 
he would accept no place there but that of chief justice there never was a man who found it so easy to delude himself he believed that he was indifferent to advancement and anxious only for the public good yet in the midst of his enormous labors he found time to write letters to every part of the country all protesting his indifference to the presidency but indicating his willingness to accept it and painting pictures so dark of the chaotic state of affairs in the government that the irresistible inference was that only he could save the country for instance he wrote to the editor of a religious newspaper saying had there been here an administration in the true sense of the word a president conferring with his cabinet and taking their united judgments and with their aid in forcing activity economy and energy in all departments of public service we could have spoken boldly and defied the world but our condition here has always been very different i preside over the funnel everybody else and especially the secretaries of war in the navy over the spigots and keep them well open too mr seward conducts the foreign relations with very little let or help from anybody there is no unity and no system except so far as it is departmental there is progress but it is slow and involuntary just what is coerced by the irresistible pressure of the vast force of the people how under such circumstances can anybody announce a policy which can only be made respectable by union wisdom and courage a few days later he wrote to another the administration cannot be continued as it is there is in fact no administration properly speaking there are departments and there is a president the latter leaves administration substantially to the heads of the former deciding himself comparatively few questions these heads act with almost absolute independence of each other he could not bring himself to feel that the universal demonstrations in favor of the re-election of mr lincoln were genuine he regarded himself all the while as the serious candidate and the opposition to him as knavish and insincere to one of his adherents he wrote it is impossible to reform and investigate without stirring up slanderers and revilers both among those whose wrongdoings are exposed and unrighteous profits taken away and among those too who think they see a good chance to take advantage of clamor to the injury of a public man who they fear stands too well with the people to an adherent in ohio he wrote i cannot help being gratified by the preference expressed for me in some quarters for those who express it are generally men of great weight and high character and independent judgment they think there will be a change in the current which so far as it is not spontaneous is chiefly managed by the blairs he said that he should be glad to have ohio decidedly on his side and that if ohio should express a preference for any other person he would not allow his name to be used this was quite an unnecessary engagement as no candidate could possibly be nominated without the support of his own state indifferent as he claimed to be in regard to his personal prospects yet he wrote on the sixth of february promising to try to find a place for a man recommended by the editor of the evening post and complaining with some bitterness that the paper had not uttered a kind word in reference to him for some months past there was in fact no limit to these overtures of the secretary in every direction which he thought might be serviceable to him a few days after the death of archbishop hughes we find him writing to archbishop purcell of cincinnati reporting the efforts which he is making in every quarter to have the western prelate appointed the successor of the dead archbishop on the eighteenth of january he wrote to a friend of his in toledo ohio mr james c hall formally announcing his candidacy for the presidency he told mr hall that a committee of prominent senators representatives and citizens had been organized to promote his election that a subcommittee had conferred with him and he had consented to their wishes he then went on to say if i know my own heart i desire nothing so much as the suppression of this rebellion and the establishment of union order and prosperity on sure and safe foundations and i should despise myself if i felt capable of allowing any personal objects to influence me to any action which would affect by one jot or tittle 
injuriously the accomplishment of those objects and it is a source of real gratification to believe that those who desire my nomination desire it on public grounds alone and will not hesitate in any manner which may concern me to act upon such grounds and such grounds only he added that he desired the support of ohio and that if he did not receive it he would cheerfully acquiesce all through the winter this quasi candidacy continued it seemed of the utmost importance to the secretary and his few adherents though it really formed an imperceptible eddy beside the vast current in which the will of the people was sweeping forward to its purpose being confined exclusively to politicians it had of course its principal manifestation in washington it played its little part in the election of speaker of the house of representatives an attempt was made to identify mr colfax the most popular candidate for that office with the adherents of mr chase but upon hearing of this he at once sought an audience with the president and positively repudiated any such connection when congress had organized the message of the president was received with an enthusiasm which for the moment swept out of sight every trace of opposing opinion from that moment there was no further question in regard to the republican nomination there was at one time an effort on the part of some of the leading spirits in the union league a secret republican organization which had been very zealous and effective in political work throughout the loyal states to commit it to some measure hostile to mr lincoln this had alarmed even so experienced and astute an observer as thurlow weed who sent to mr seward in the autumn of eighteen sixty three a warning that loyal leagues into which odd fellows and know-nothings rush are fixing to control delegate appointments for mr chase mr seward accepted this warning somewhat too readily induced by his inveterate anti-masonic prejudices these fears had no substantial foundation some of the leaders of the league sympathizing strongly with the radicals of missouri had indeed from time to time made efforts to commit the order against the president but such attempts failed there as elsewhere on account of the overwhelming tide of contrary opinion and when the principal chapter of the order met in washington on the tenth of december they elected a list of officers who were almost all either friends of mr lincoln or men of sufficient sagacity not to oppose him from the beginning mr lincoln had been fully aware of mr chase's candidacy and of everything that was done for its promotion it was impossible for him to remain unconscious of it and although he discouraged all conversation on the subject and refused to read letters relating to it he could not entirely shut the matter out from his cognizance he had his own opinion on the taste and judgment displayed by mr chase in his criticisms of the president and of his colleagues in the cabinet but he took no notice of them i have determined he said to shut my eyes so far as possible to everything of the sort mr chase makes a good secretary and i shall keep him where he is if he becomes president all right i hope we may never have a worse man i have observed with regret his plan of strengthening himself whenever he sees that an important matter is troubling me if i am compelled to decide in a way to give offence to a man of some influence he always ranges himself in opposition to me and persuades the victim that he has been hardly dealt with and that he would have arranged it very differently it was so with general fremont with general hunter when i annulled his hasty proclamation with general butler when he was recalled from new orleans with these missouri people when they called the other day i am entirely indifferent as to his success or failure in these schemes so long as he does his duty at the head of the treasury department when rosencrans was removed from the command of the army of the cumberland mr chase pursued the same course his spiteful comments on that act were reported to the president who simply laughed at the zealous friend who brought him the news when told that such tactics might give mr chase the nomination he said he hoped the country would never do worse he regretted however that the thing had begun because although it did not annoy him his friends thought it ought to he went on appointing by the dozen mr chase's partisans and adherents to places in the government he knew perfectly well what he was doing and allowed himself the luxury of a quiet smile as he signed their commissions 
he heard more of such gossip than was amusing or agreeable to him he said on one occasion i wish they would stop thrusting that subject of the presidency into my face i do not want to hear anything about it of course one reason for the magnanimity with which mr lincoln endured this rivalry of his able and ambitious minister of finance was his consciousness of the inequality of the match between them although his renomination was a matter in regard to which he refused to converse much even with intimate friends he was perfectly aware of the drift of things in capacity of appreciating popular currents and in judgment of individual character mr chase was a child beside him and he allowed the opposition to himself and his own cabinet to continue without question or remark with all the more patience and forbearance because he knew how feeble it was the movement in favor of mr chase culminated in the month of february in a secret circular signed by senator samuel c pomeroy of kansas and widely circulated throughout the union it is admitted by mr chase's sincerest admirers that the weak point of his character was the incapacity shown in his judgment of men and his choice of intimates and in no instance was this defect more glaringly exhibited than in the selection of such a man as senator pomeroy to conduct his canvass for the presidency the two kansas senators lane and pomeroy hated each other intensely and so long as they were in office together wrangled persistently over the patronage of their state the president once wrote to pomeroy after declining an interview with him i wish you and lane would make a sincere effort to get out of the mood you are in it does neither of you any good it gives you the means of tormenting my life out of me and nothing else each thought the other got the advantage of him each abused the president roundly behind his back but lane being the more subtle and adroit politician of the two never allowed himself to be put in an attitude of open hostility to the administration pomeroy's resentment drove him at last into a mood of sullen animosity toward the president and it was under his weak leadership that the elements of opposition to mr lincoln at last came together as the confidential circular issued by the committee of which pomeroy was the head was the most considerable effort made within the republican party to defeat the renomination of mr lincoln we give the document to show upon how slender a foundation this opposition was based the movements recently made throughout the country to secure the renomination of president lincoln render necessary some counteraction on the part of those unconditional friends of the union who differ from the policy of his administration so long as no efforts were made to forestall the political action of the people it was both wise and patriotic for all true friends of the government to devote their influence to the suppression of the rebellion but when it becomes evident that party machinery and official influence are being used to secure the perpetuation of the present administration those who conscientiously believe that the interests of the country and of freedom demand a change in favor of vigor and purity and nationality have no choice but to appeal at once to the people before it shall be too late to secure a fair discussion of principles those in behalf of whom this communication is made have thoughtfully surveyed the political field and have arrived at the following conclusions first that even were the re-election of mr lincoln desirable it is practically impossible against the union of influences which will oppose him second that should he be re-elected his manifest tendency towards compromises and temporary expedients of policy will become stronger during a second term than it has been in the first and the cause of human liberty and the dignity and honor of the nation suffer proportionately while the war may continue to languish during his whole administration till the public debt shall become a burden too great to be borne third that the patronage of the government through the necessities of the war has been so rapidly increased and to such an enormous extent and so loosely placed as to render the application of the one-term principle absolutely essential to the certain safety of our republican institutions fourth that we find united in honorable salmon p chase more of the qualities needed in a president during the next four years than are combined in any other available candidate his record clear and unimpeachable 
show him to be a statesman of rare ability and an administrator of the very highest order while his private character furnishes the surest obtainable guarantee of economy and purity in the management of public affairs fifth that the discussion of the presidential question already commenced by the friends of mr lincoln has developed a popularity and strength in mr chase unexpected even to his warmest admirers and while we are aware that this strength is at present unorganized and in no condition to manifest its real magnitude we are satisfied that it only needs systematic and faithful effort to develop it to an extent sufficient to overcome all opposing obstacles for these reasons the friends of mr chase have determined on measures which shall present his claims fairly and at once to the country a central organization has been effected which already has its connections in all the states and the object of which is to enable his friends everywhere most effectually to promote his elevation to the presidency we wish the hearty cooperation of all those in favor of the speedy restoration of the union upon the basis of universal freedom and who desire an administration of the government during the first period of its new life which shall to the fullest extent develop the capacity of free institutions enlarge the resources of the country diminish the burdens of taxation elevate the standard of public and private morality vindicate the honor of the republic before the world and in all things make our american nationality the fairest example for imitation which human progress has ever achieved if these objects meet your approval you can render efficient aid by exerting yourself at once to organize your section of the country and by corresponding with the chairman of the national executive committee for the purpose either of receiving or imparting information of this circular sent broadcast over the country many copies of course fell into the hands of the president's friends and they soon began to come to the executive mansion the president who was absolutely without curiosity in regard to attacks upon himself refused to look at them and they accumulated unread in the desk of his secretary at last however the circular got into print and it appeared in the national intelligencer of washington on the morning of the twenty second of february mr chase at once wrote to the president to assure him that he had no knowledge of the existence of the letter before seeing it in print he gave a brief account of the solicitations of his friends in compliance with which he had consented to be a candidate for the presidency adding i have never wished that my name should have a moment's thought in comparison with the common cause of enfranchisement and restoration or be continued before the public a moment after the indication of a preference by the friends of that cause for another i have thought this explanation due to you as well as to myself if there is anything in my action or position which in your judgment will prejudice the public interests under my charge i beg you to say so i do not wish to administer the treasury department one day without your entire confidence for yourself i cherish sincere respect and esteem and permit me to add affection differences of opinion as to administrative action have not changed these sentiments nor have they been changed by assaults upon me by persons who profess themselves the special representatives of your views and policy you are not responsible for acts not your own nor will you hold me responsible except for what i do or say myself great numbers now desire your re-election should their wishes be fulfilled by the suffrages of the people i hope to carry with me into private life the sentiments i now cherish whole and unimpaired the president next day acknowledged the receipt of this letter and promised to answer it more fully when he could find time to do so the next week he wrote at greater length i would have taken time to answer yours of the twenty second sooner only that i did not suppose any evil could result from the delay especially as by a note i promptly acknowledged the receipt of yours and promised a fuller answer now on consideration i find there is really very little to say my knowledge of mr pomeroy's letter having been made public came to me only the day you wrote but i had in spite of myself known of its existence several days before i have not yet read it and i think i shall not 
i was not shocked or surprised by the appearance of the letter because i had had knowledge of mr pomeroy's committee and of secret issues which i supposed came from it and of secret agents who i supposed were sent out by it for several weeks i have known just as little of these things as my friends have allowed me to know they bring the documents to me but i do not read them they tell me what they think fit to tell me but i do not inquire for more i fully concur with you that neither of us can be justly held responsible for what our respective friends may do without our instigation or countenance and i assure you as you have assured me that no assault has been made upon you by my instigation or with my countenance whether you shall remain at the head of the treasury department is a question which i will not allow myself to consider from any standpoint other than my judgment of the public service and in that view i do not perceive occasion for a change before the president wrote this letter the candidacy of mr chase had already passed completely out of sight in fact it could never have been said to exist except in the imagination of mr chase in a narrow circle of adherence he was by no means the choice even of the great body of the radicals who were discontented with mr lincoln so early as the seventeenth of december eighteen sixty three joseph mcdill the editor of the chicago tribune who represented the most vehement republican sentiment of the northwest wrote i presume it is true that mr chase's friends are working for his nomination but it is all lost labor old abe has the inside track so completely that he will be nominated by acclamation when the convention meets the people will say to chase you stick to finance and be content until after eighteen sixty eight and to grant give the rebels no rest put them through your reward will come in due time but uncle abe must be allowed to boss the reconstruction of the union and from the opening of the year eighteen sixty four the feeling in favor of the renomination of lincoln grew so ardent and so restless that it was almost impossible for the most discreet of the republican leaders to hold the manifestations of the popular preference in check an attempt was made by the treasury officials in indiana to prevent the state convention which met in february from declaring for lincoln but it was all in vain wherever any assembly of republicans came together fresh from the people the only struggle was as to who should get first on the floor to demand the president's renomination mr chase's principal hope was of course founded upon the adhesion of his friends in ohio but the result there as elsewhere proved how blind he was to the course of politics the governor of the state wrote to the president that he was mortified to hear that he had been set down as a chase man the fact that mr chase has been laboring for the past year at least with an eye single to promoting his own selfish purposes totally regardless of the consequences to the government as i believe has been the case is alone sufficient to induce me to oppose him but aside from this the policy inaugurated under your lead must be maintained and it would be suicidal to change leaders in the midst of the contest this is only a specimen of dozens of letters which came from the leading men of the state who had been relied upon by mr chase to promote his canvass and finally the feeling grew so strong in ohio that although no authorized convention of republicans was to meet at that time the union members of the legislature took the matter in hand and gave on the twenty fifth of february the coup de grace to the secretary's candidacy they held a full caucus and nominated mr lincoln for re-election at the demand as they said of the people and the soldiers of ohio the state of rhode island which mr chase had expected the personal influence of his son-in-law governor sprague to secure for him also made haste to range itself with the other states of the north and as more than a month before the great state of pennsylvania had by the unanimous expression of the union members of its legislature declared for lincoln the secretary at last concluded that the contest was hopeless and wrote another letter to mr hall referring to his former statement that should his friends in ohio manifest a preference for another he would acquiesce in that decision and adding the recent action of the union members of our legislature indicates such a preference it becomes my duty therefore and i count it more a privilege than a duty to ask that no further consideration be given to my name it was never more important than now that all our efforts and all our energies be devoted to the suppression of the rebellion 
and to the restoration of order and prosperity on solid and sure foundations of union freedom and impartial justice and i earnestly urge all with whom my counsels may have weight to allow nothing to divide them while this great work in comparison with which persons and even parties are nothing remains unaccomplished in the closing line of this letter occurs the first intimation of that feeling of revolt against the republican party which afterwards led mr chase to seek the nomination of the democrats in numerous letters written during the spring he reiterated his absolute withdrawal from the contest but indulged in sneers and insinuations against the president which show how deeply he was wounded by his discomfiture end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Thirteen: Grant, General in Chief. The winter of eighteen sixty three to sixty four was unusually cold and after the exacting work of the autumn both western armies lay exhausted in their camps about chattanooga on the confederate side the ill fortune of their army was avenged in the usual manner bragg was deprived of his command although through the favor and friendship of mr davis he was afterwards ordered to richmond in the anomalous capacity of chief of staff and military adviser to the confederate president who sorely against his personal wishes felt himself compelled by the demands of public opinion to place general joseph e johnston at the head of the principal confederate armies of the west general polk took the place of johnston as commander of the department of mississippi and east louisiana and johnston proceeded immediately to dalton assuming command of the army of tennessee on the twenty seventh of december his instructions from richmond were couched in an optimistic tone mr seddon the confederate secretary of war said the movements of the enemy give no indication of a purpose to attack your army and it is probable that they may mean to strengthen themselves in the occupation of the portions of tennessee they have overrun it is not desirable they should be allowed to do so with impunity and as soon as the condition of your forces will allow it is hoped you will be able to resume the offensive at the same time it was clearly intimated to him that he must depend exclusively on the resources of his own department or on such help as general polk might be able to give him president davis also addressed the general in terms of exasperating serenity and composure he quoted to him a letter received from bragg in which that beaten commander said we can redeem the past let us concentrate all our available men unite them with this little army still full of zeal and burning to redeem its lost character and prestige hurl the whole upon the enemy and crush him in his power and his glory mr davis went on to tell general johnston that his army was after all in excellent condition you will not need to have it suggested he said that the imperative demand for prompt and vigorous action arises not only from the importance of restoring the prestige of the army and averting the injurious and dispiriting results that must attend a season of inactivity but from the necessity of reoccupying the country upon the supplies of which the proper subsistence of our armies materially depends the confederate president had a gift of never writing to johnston without infuriating him and one of the general's first duties on arriving at dalton and hurriedly inspecting his new command was to sit down and inform his president of the hard task he had set him and the insufficient means with which he had provided him he said he had present for duty about forty three thousand men the effective total of infantry and artillery being not quite thirty six thousand with twenty five hundred cavalry which he said was not very efficient he gave bragg's estimate of grant's force at eighty thousand an estimate which he elsewhere confessed was greatly exaggerated but he was bent on making out his own case as strong as possible he acknowledged the importance of recovering the territory lost but brought forward the serious difficulties that stood in the way if he should advance through east tennessee the way to georgia was left open if through the middle of the state the obstacles were chattanooga now a fortress the tennessee river the rugged desert of the cumberland mountains and an army outnumbering his own more than two to one he risked a suggestion which to the ears of the authorities in richmond had at the time an ominous and sinister sound 
though necessity forced it upon them afterwards the strengthening of the armies of the confederacy by the substitution of negroes for all the soldiers on detached or daily duty and in connection with this he made a remark which showed the subtle disorganization even then beginning to be apparent throughout the confederacy my experience in mississippi was that impressed negroes run away whenever it is possible and are frequently encouraged by their masters to do so and i never knew one to be returned by his master general johnston says that he found dalton had not been selected by bragg on account of any merit as a strategic position but simply because the retreat from missionary ridge ceased at that town the federal army having abandoned the pursuit each division occupied the place it had taken for the encampment of a night and they afterwards constructed at these points huts for their winter quarters the army occupied a precipitous ridge called rocky face crossed by the railroad from dalton to chattanooga at mill creek gap three and a half miles west of dalton but terminating only three miles north of that point and therefore easily flanked by the rheingold road this position could also be turned by snake creek gap traversing the mountains to the south he says he could have withdrawn to calhoun on the atlanta road had it not been for the earnestness with which mr davis and mr seddon urged an early resumption of offensive operations and their apprehensions of the bad effect of a retrograde movement on the spirits of the southern people the possession of kentucky and tennessee the vast subsistence depots of the south was a matter of such vital importance that the confederate government at richmond could not for a moment give up the hope of speedily regaining them on the other hand nothing was further from the mind of general grant than to rest content even with the retention of the vast gains of the autumn the early part of the winter was necessarily taken up in the strengthening of his position and the subsistence of his army a matter which on both sides of the line was attended with the greatest labor and difficulty but the nashville and chattanooga railroad was completed on the fourteenth of january and trains began running regularly from nashville to chattanooga relieving somewhat the dearth of supplies steps were then immediately taken to begin repairing the east tennessee and georgia railroad which was put in running order as far as loudon four weeks later meanwhile general sherman who commanded the department of the tennessee and therefore had especially in his charge the east bank of the mississippi river from natchez to the ohio asked and received permission from general grant to go down the mississippi river to strike a blow at the confederate forces in the interior of the state of mississippi and by this means if possible put a stop to the annoyance and obstruction which raids on the river occasioned to the traffic of that stream it was proposed that banks should at the same time make a similar movement in louisiana sherman therefore prepared a picked force of two columns consisting of two divisions each mcpherson commanding the right and hurlbut the left which started east from vicksburg on the third of february at the same time a large cavalry force under the command of general w suey smith was to start south from memphis to ride through the country and join general sherman at meridian mississippi sherman marched in the lightest possible order and without deployment straight for meridian distant one hundred and fifty miles he soon came in contact with the rebel cavalry but with his compact force brushed them like flies before him meeting with no substantial opposition a curious incident befell him at the village of decatur hurlbut's column was several miles in advance and sherman halted with his escort at a farmhouse which he entered he asked for supper and lying down went to sleep he was soon awakened by a great noise and confusion in the farmyard some of hurlbut's wagons which were passing had been attacked by rebel cavalry sherman gathered his clerks and orderlies together and was preparing to defend himself in a corn crib when the head of mcpherson's column appeared on the road and the confederate troops rode away unconscious of the rich prize they had for a moment in their grasp sherman entered meridian on the fourteenth destroying the arsenals and storehouses and the railroads in every direction for miles around he sent out a large force of infantry to break up the mobile and ohio road to the north and south and the jackson and selma road to the east and west he had succeeded in creating the impression on the minds of the rebel authorities in the state that his objective point was mobile an impression which was confirmed by demonstration made at the point of farragut and his march for this reason caused immense excitement which effectively furthered his real purpose unfortunately the cavalry force under general smith did not accomplish their part of the plan 
they lost several days in getting started and were finally defeated and driven back by forest near west point below okolona on the mobile and ohio road sherman after waiting a week at meridian for news of smith having utterly destroyed the railroads in that region began to retrace his steps toward vicksburg leaving his troops to follow at their leisure he took a small escort and in advance of his army rode into vicksburg on the twenty ninth of february after a hasty visit to new orleans where he arranged to furnish a corps of some ten thousand men to banks to assist in his operations west of the river he went up the mississippi to report to grant the continued presence of longstreet in east tennessee had become very irksome to grant and on the tenth of february having accumulated supplies for the support of a considerable force at knoxville he ordered thomas to start for that place on the thirteenth to cooperate with the army of the ohio in driving longstreet out of the country but before thomas moved grant had a conversation at nashville with general j g foster who had been relieved by general schofield and was on his way to the north which convinced him that what might be accomplished by the proposed campaign would not compensate for the hardships which the men would endure and the disadvantage which would result to the coming spring campaign at the same time he acquired the impression that most of johnston's force had been withdrawn from thomas's front he therefore changed the orders he had given for the march to knoxville but as thomas was all ready for the road he directed him to move to his immediate front the object being to gain possession of dalton and as far south of that as possible this impression of general grant's proved to be erroneous the rebel authorities in richmond as well as in mississippi had been greatly disturbed by sherman's move to meridian it was taken for granted that mobile was in danger mr davis telegraphed to johnston either to send polk reinforcements or to join him in person with what force he could general johnston very sensibly replied that it would be impossible for troops from dalton to meet the federal army before it reached the gulf and in answer to subsequent solicitations he said that such an expedition would require two-thirds of his army and involve the abandonment of his present line upon which davis directed him peremptorily to send infantry enough to enable polk to beat the detachment which the enemy has thrown far into the interior of our country and when johnston replied in his habitual tone that it was too late for such an object mr davis gave him at last a positive order to send hardy with his corps to polk without delay johnston obeyed this order with such deliberation that hardy's advance which did not start until sherman was preparing to return never got farther than the tom big b river and his troops were recalled by mr davis himself on the twenty third so that when general thomas moved forward under the impression entertained by grant that johnston's army had been withdrawn from dalton he found the confederates in full force in their entrenchments and on the ridge of rocky face after a thorough reconnaissance finding that the supposed conditions under which the movement was made did not exist thomas withdrew his army to his former position schofield who had relieved foster in tennessee after a brief demonstration against longstreet who was retiring from his front also had returned for lack of supplies and of transportation it seems impossible to exaggerate the helpless condition of the armies on both sides in the matter of transportation thomas says scarcely any of his artillery could be moved for lack of horses and johnston reports that for a long time after he arrived at dalton his artillery horses were so feeble from their hard service and scarcity of forage that it was not only impossible to maneuver the batteries in action but also to march with them at the ordinary rate of speed on ordinary roads and even so late as february when the supply of forage had become regular and the face of the country almost dry the teams of the napoleon guns were unable to draw them up a trifling hill over which the roads to their stables passed immediately after the victories at chattanooga mr washbourne of illinois the devoted friend and firm supporter of general grant through good and evil report introduced a bill in congress to revive the grade of lieutenant-general in the army the measure occasioned a good deal of discussion this high rank had never been conferred on any citizen of the republic except washington who held it for a short time before his death it was discontinued for more than half a century and then conferred by brevet only upon general scott there were those who feared or affected to fear that so high military rank was threatening to the liberties of the republic the great majority of congress however considered the liberties of the republic more robust than this fear would indicate and the bill was finally passed on the twenty sixth of february and received the approval of the president on the twenty ninth of february it provided for the revival of the grade of lieutenant-general and authorized the president to appoint 
by and with the advice and consent of the senate a lieutenant general to be selected from among those officers in the military service of the united states not below the grade of major general most distinguished for courage skill and ability who being commissioned as lieutenant general may be authorized under the direction and during the pleasure of the president to command the armies of the united states immediately upon signing the bill the president nominated grant to the senate for the office created by it although the bill of course mentioned the name of no general there was no pretense from the beginning that any one else was thought of in connection with the place the administration exercised no influence in the matter neither helping nor hindering the progress of the bill through the houses of congress it had already become clearly manifest that general halleck although an officer of great learning and ability was not fitted by character or temperament for the assumption of such weighty responsibilities as the military situation required the president himself said about this time when it appeared that mcclellan was incompetent to the work of handling the army and we sent for halleck to take command he stipulated that it should be with the full powers and responsibilities of general-in-chief he kept that attitude until pope's defeat but ever since that event he has shrunk from responsibility whenever it was possible so that in the mind of the president as well as in the intention of congress and the acquiescence of the public there was no thought of nominating any one but grant to the chief command of all the armies whether he was or was not the ablest of all our generals is a question which can never be decided perhaps there were legionnaires in the army of gaul as able as caesar if occasion had been given them to show it the success and fame of generals is the joint result of merit and of opportunity and grant was beyond all comparison the most fortunate of american soldiers whatever criticism might be made on his character his learning or his methods the fact was not to be denied that he had reaped the most substantial successes of the war he had captured two armies and utterly defeated a third he was justly entitled by virtue of the spolia opima with which he had presented the republic to his triumph to be celebrated with all the pomp and circumstance possible the senate immediately confirmed his nomination and on the third of march the secretary of war directed him to report in person to the war department as early as practicable considering the condition of his command he started for washington the next day but in the midst of his hurried preparations for departure he found time to write a letter of the most warm and generous friendship to sherman he had not even yet heard the news of his confirmation but he took it for granted he said i start in the morning to comply with the order but i shall say very distinctly on my arrival there that i shall accept no appointment which will require me to make that city washington my headquarters while i have been eminently successful in this war in at least gaining the confidence of the public no one feels more than i how much of this success is due to the energy skill and harmonious putting forth of that energy and skill of those whom it has been my good fortune to have occupying subordinate positions under me there are many officers to whom these remarks are applicable to a greater or less degree proportionate to their ability as soldiers but what i want is to express my thanks to you and mcpherson as the men to whom above all others i feel indebted for whatever i have had of success how far your advice and suggestions have been of assistance you know how far your execution of whatever has been given you to do entitles you to the reward i am receiving you cannot know as well as i do i feel all the gratitude this letter would express giving it the most flattering construction the word you i use in the plural intending it for mcpherson also this letter was as unique as it was admirable for grant wrote in this strain to no one else in the world there seemed no room in his heart for more than two such friends when mcpherson died in the flower of his young manhood sheridan took the vacant place in the confidence and affection of his great chief where he and sherman remained ever after without rivals sherman who received the letter on his way up the river from the meridian raid answered in a similar strain with even more of ardent and liberal eulogy you do yourself injustice and us too much honor in assigning to us so large a share of the merits which have led to your high advancement you are now washington's legitimate successor and occupy a position of almost dangerous elevation but if you can continue as heretofore to be yourself simple honest and unpretending you will enjoy through life the respect and love of friends and the homage of millions of human beings who will award you a large share for securing to them and their descendants a government of law and stability i repeat you do general mcpherson and myself too much honor at belmont you manifested your traits neither of us being near 
at donelson also you illustrated your whole character i was not near and general mcpherson in too subordinate a capacity to influence you i believe you are as brave patriotic and just as the great prototype washington as unselfish kind-hearted and honest as a man should be but the chief characteristic in your nature is the simple faith in success you have always manifested which i can liken to nothing else than the faith a christian has in his saviour this faith you gave your victory at shiloh and vicksburg also when you have completed your best preparations you go into battle without hesitation as at chattanooga no doubts no reserve and i tell you that it was this that made us act with confidence i knew wherever i was that you thought of me and if i got in a tight place you would come if alive now as to the future do not stay in washington halleck is better qualified than you are to stand the buffets of intrigue and policy come out west take to yourself the whole mississippi valley let us make it dead sure and i tell you the atlantic slope and pacific shores will follow its destiny as sure as the limbs of a tree live or die with the main trunk we have done much still much remains to be done time and time's influences are all with us we could almost afford to sit still and let these influences work even in the seceded states your word now would go farther than a president's proclamation or an act of congress for god's sake and for your country's sake come out of washington i foretold to general halleck before he left corinth the inevitable result to him and i now exhort you to come out west here lies the seat of the coming empire and from the west when our task is done we will make short work of charleston and richmond and the impoverished coast of the atlantic in both of these letters there is apparent not a very intelligent dread of washington and its political influences something of the feeling which sailors have towards lawyers grant assures sherman beforehand that he shall not accept his new grade if he is compelled to make his headquarters in washington and sherman adjures him by all that is sacred to avoid the atlantic coast altogether it evidently did not enter the minds of either that the loftiest honors and no small degree of enjoyment awaited both of them in years to come in the city which they regarded with such superstitious apprehensions grant proceeded on his way to the capital as quietly as possible but the rumors of his coming went everywhere before him and his train moved through a continual storm of cheering and enthusiasm from nashville to washington he reached there on the evening of the eighth of march there was to be a reception at the executive mansion and as grant's arrival was expected the throng was very great at about half past nine grant entered and he and the president met for the first time a certain movement and rumor in the crowd heralded the approach of the most famous guest of the evening and when general grant stood before mr lincoln they recognized each other without formal presentation and cordially shook hands the thronging crowd with instinctive deference stood back for a moment while the president and the general exchanged a few words of conversation lincoln then introduced seward to grant and the secretary of state took him away to present him to mrs lincoln he then went on to the east room where his presence excited a feeling which burst the bonds of etiquette and cheer after cheer rose from the assembled crowd hot and blushing with embarrassment he was forced to mount a sofa from which he could shake hands with the eager admirers who rushed upon him from all sides of the great room it was an hour before he could return to the small drawing-room where after the departure of the crowd the president awaited him the president here made an appointment with him for the formal presentation next day of his commission as lieutenant-general i shall make a very short speech to you said lincoln to which i desire you to reply for an object and that you may be properly prepared to do so i have written what i shall say only four sentences in all which i will read from my manuscript as an example which you may follow and also read your reply as you are perhaps not so much accustomed to public speaking as i am and i therefore give you what i shall say to you that you may consider it there are two points that i would like to have you make in your answer first to say something which shall prevent or obviate any jealousy of you from any of the other generals in the service and second something which shall put you on as good terms as possible with the army of the potomac if you see any objection to doing this be under no restraint whatever in expressing that objection to the secretary of war general grant and mr stanton left the room together the next day at one o'clock in the presence of the cabinet general halleck two members of general grant's staff and the president's private secretary the commission of lieutenant-general was formally delivered by the president mr lincoln said general grant 
the nation's appreciation of what you have done and its reliance upon you for what remains to do in the existing great struggle are now presented with this commission constituting you lieutenant general in the army of the united states with this high honor devolves upon you also a corresponding responsibility as the country herein trusts you so under god it will sustain you i scarcely need to add that with what i here speak for the nation goes my own hearty personal concurrence the general had hurriedly and almost illegibly written his speech on half a sheet of note-paper in lead pencil his embarrassment was evident and extreme he found his own writing very difficult to read but what he said could hardly have been improved mr president i accept this commission with gratitude for the high honor conferred with the aid of the noble armies that have fought on so many fields for our common country it will be my earnest endeavor not to disappoint your expectations I feel the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me, and I know that if they are met, it will be due to those armies, and above all, to the favor of that providence which leads both nations and men. It will be observed that he made no reference whatever to the subject of the President's request the night before. It is not known whether he did this after consultation with Stanton, or whether, with his deep distrust of Washington politicians, he thought it wise to begin by disregarding all their suggestions. On the same day, General Halleck sent a letter to the Secretary of War, respectfully requesting that since the grade of Lieutenant General, superior to his own, had been created, and the distinguished officer promoted to that rank had received his commission and reported for duty, that orders might be issued placing him in command of the Army and relieving General Halleck from that duty. In making this request, he says, I am influenced solely by a desire to conform to the provisions of the law which, in my opinion, impose upon a lieutenant general the duties and responsibilities of general-in-chief of the army after the presentation of the commission a brief conversation took place general grant inquired what special service was expected of him the president replied that the country wanted him to take richmond he said our generals had not been fortunate in their efforts in that direction and asked if the lieutenant general could do it grant without hesitation answered that he could if he had the troops these the president assured him he should have there was not one word said as to what route to Richmond should be chosen. The next day Grant visited General Meade at the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac at Brandy Station. He had known General Meade slightly in the Mexican War, but had not met him since. He was a stranger to the Army of the Potomac, with the exception of a few officers of the regular army whom he had known in Mexico. Meade received him not only with the courtesy and deference due to his high rank and great services, but with a generosity and magnanimity which impressed Grant most favorably. Meade said that it was possible Grant might want an officer to command the Army of the Potomac who had been with him in the West, and made a special mention of Sherman. He begged him that if that was the case not to hesitate about making the change. He urged, says Grant, that the work before us was of such vast importance to the whole nation that the feelings or wishes of no one person should stand in the way of selecting the right men for all positions. For himself, he would serve to the best of his ability wherever placed. Grant assured him that he had no thought of making any change, and that Sherman could not be spared from the West. He returned to Washington on the 11th. The next day he was placed in command of all the armies by orders from the War Department, but without waiting for a single day to accept the lavish proffers of hospitality which were showered upon him, he started west again on the evening of the 11th of March. In that short time he had utterly changed his views and plans for the future conduct of the war. He had relinquished the purpose he had hitherto firmly held of leading the western armies on the great campaign to Atlanta and the sea, and had decided to take the field with the Army of the Potomac. When I got to Washington, he said, and saw the situation, it was plain that here was the point for the commanding general to be. No one else could probably resist the pressure that would be brought to bear upon him to desist from his own plans and pursue others. He therefore hurried back to the West to make preparations for finally severing his relations with those magnificent armies which had gained him so many victories. Sherman, at his request, was promoted to command the military division of the Mississippi. McPherson succeeded to Sherman's command of the Department of the Tennessee, and Logan was promoted to the command of McPherson's Corps. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 8, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 14. The Wilderness. General Grant made but a brief visit to the West. Sherman assumed command of the military division of the Mississippi on the 18th of March, and then accompanied the general-in-chief as far as Cincinnati on the road to Washington. Every hour was now important, and valuable time was saved by this long conference on the rail. Besides the great subject of the coming campaign, the two friends and comrades discussed the disposition which should be made of various officers then out of employment. This was a delicate matter, and seemed both to Grant and the government more important than it really was. There were few indispensable men, and the political influence of the more conspicuous was far less than was claimed. There was little embarrassment on the score of rank, as a law passed in 1862 had given to the President the power of appointment of generals to special commands, without regard to the date of their commissions. When Sherman was promoted over the heads of Thomas and Hooker, and McPherson was put in command over Hurlbut, all of these superseded officers acquiesced with patriotic cheerfulness in what, according to the strict rules of the service, seemed an injustice. Others, it is true, were not so self-sacrificing. General Buell, being offered the command of a corps under Sherman, declined to serve under his junior, and was soon after mustered out of the service. Grant was solicited by the friends of Fremont and McClellan to provide them with commands, but this he declined to do, and both resigned during their political campaigns for the presidency. The general-in-chief established his headquarters at Culpeper Courthouse near the end of March, and spent a month in preparations for the great campaign which he, in common with the entire North, hoped would end the war. He visited Washington several times and had occasional conversations with the President. He says in his memoirs that he was warned, at an early day, by Halleck and Stanton not to communicate his plan of campaign to Mr. Lincoln, but he found this warning as superfluous as it was impertinent. Mr. Lincoln expressly assured him he preferred not to know his purposes. He desired only to learn what means he needed to carry them out, and promised to furnish these to the full extent of his power. He was, however, especially pleased to learn that the new general-in-chief intended to employ the full strength of the army in a simultaneous concerted movement all along the line, which should keep the enemy everywhere employed, and prevent him from concentrating at threatened points. This was the object which the President had striven for in vain through three years of war. This, the course which he had urged upon successive generals without effect, and which, in despair of seeing the purposes attained in any other way, he had embodied in his general orders of January 27, 1862. The plan of the Lieutenant General, as set forth in his report, was extremely simple. So far as practicable, the armies were to move together, and towards one common center, Banks was to finish his operations in Louisiana, and, leaving a small garrison on the Rio Grande, was to concentrate an army of some 25,000 men, and move on Mobile. Sherman was to move simultaneously with the other armies, General Johnston's army being his objective, and the heart of Georgia his ultimate aim. Siegel, who was in command in the Shenandoah, was to move to the front in two columns, one to threaten the enemy in the valley— the other to cut the railroads connecting Richmond with the southwest. Gilmore was to be brought north with his corps, and in company with another corps, under W. F. Smith, was to form an army under General B. F. Butler to operate against Richmond south of the James. Lee's army was to be the objective point of Meade, reinforced by Burnside. As to the route by which the Army of the Potomac was to advance, Grant reserved his decision until just before he started upon his march. There were advantages and drawbacks to a move by either flank. Moving by the right would have led him through a more open and better cultivated country, would have brought him into immediate collision with the enemy on a terrain more suitable for field operations, and especially better adapted for the use of artillery than that which he would find on the left. But the disadvantage of that route was that his line of communication would have been constantly exposed. Large detachments of troops would have been required to protect Alexandria Railroad and the depots on it, the army could only carry fifteen days' rations with them, and an enormous covering force would have been required to protect the roads and the trains, by which additional supplies would have to be brought. A great number of wounded would certainly have to be provided for, and this could be much more conveniently managed in a movement to the left, on account of the easy access everywhere afforded to water transportation. 
moving by the latter route the line of supply by the railroad could be at once abandoned and short routes of communication opened from the protective flank to navigable waters connected with washington the moral or political advantages and objections to the move by the left flank were also obvious it was sure to be vehemently criticized by all the partisans of mcclellan who insisted that the only rational approach to richmond was on the line of the james and on the other hand the president although refraining from any suggestion to general grant felt that beginning a siege of richmond with lee's army wholly intact and free to move in any direction was thoroughly undesirable and that in a move upon that army overland the constant access by water to our left flank was an advantage not to be lightly thrown away the main consideration in the mind of grant and in this he was sustained by the best minds in the army of the potomac was that the war could not be brought to a close until the power of lee's army was broken that without this even the capture of richmond would not avail that lee was too good a general to shut himself up in the defences of that city and court the face of pemberton that if he were brought to the neighbourhood of richmond without a battle the extension he would naturally give his lines would render their complete envelopment impracticable and that if richmond should be captured while the army of virginia was still strong enough to keep the field it might move southward and continue the war indefinitely a plan of campaign was therefore chosen which should bring the two armies into collision at once on a field at some distance from richmond where troops might be moved in large numbers by either flank and where there might be at least a chance of success in destroying or greatly diminishing the military power of the confederacy before the two antagonists in their deadly grapple should come within sight of the works which guarded the rebel capital no one dreamed of an easy victory there was no road to richmond which would not exact its frightful toll of blood move as we might says general humphreys long continued hard fighting under great difficulties was before us yet no one imagined how many days of desperate battle how many months of leaguer and march there were to be seen before this terrible campaign was to end in the great and final victory the army of the potomac now had a commander whose purpose was clear and definite and whose plan was of archaic simplicity to hammer continuously against the armed force of the enemy and his resources until by mere attrition if in no other way there should be nothing left to him but an equal submission with the loyal section of our common country to the constitution and laws of the land the two armies lay in their entrenchments on both sides of the rapidan the headquarters of general grant were at culpeper courthouse among the main body of his infantry those of lee at orange courthouse the army of northern virginia guarded the south bank of the river for eighteen or twenty miles ewell commanding the right half a p hill the left the formidable works on mine run secured the confederate right wing which was further protected by the tangled and gloomy thickets of the wilderness longstreet had arrived from tennessee with two fine divisions and was held in reserve at gordonsville the two armies were not so unequally matched as confederate writers insist the strength of the army of the potomac present for duty equipped on the thirtieth of april was one hundred and twenty two thousand one hundred and forty six this includes the twenty two thousand seven hundred and eight of burnside's ninth corps the army of northern virginia numbered at the opening of this campaign not less than sixty one thousand nine hundred and fifty three while this seems like a great disparity of strength it must not be forgotten that the confederate general had an enormous advantage of position the dense woods and the thickly timbered swamps in which he was to resist the march of the national army were as well known to him as the lines of his own hand and were absolutely unknown to his antagonist even in a successful advance in such a region the lines of the victor become thoroughly broken and the defeated party fighting on his own ground can recover almost as readily as his pursuers both armies were of excellent material the new troops in the national ranks rapidly acquired their education among the seasoned veterans of the army of the potomac and lee's force was a well-tempered blade in his practised hand on both sides the troops had commanders worthy of them the army of the potomac had been thoroughly reorganized and reduced to three corps the second commanded by hancock who had recovered from his wounds received at gettysburg and now came back to complete his record of the most brilliant soldier in action that our army has ever known the fifth which warren led with eminent ability and devotion and the sixth commanded by the beloved and trusted sedgwick burnside with the ninth corps had at first an independent command but this was soon found to be an impracticable arrangement and it was united late in may with the army of meade 
the cavalry was placed under sheridan who had been brought from the west for that service general grant had not seen pleasanton's meritorious service from chancellorsville to gettysburg but he had seen sheridan in that heroic rush up the slope of missionary ridge and he was much given to trusting the evidence of his own eyes under these five commanders were many already famous who were to win still greater renown before the year was gone humphreys park barlow gibbon burney wright crawford getty gregg j h wilson wilcox griffin ricketts and many for whom even then a welcome was preparing in valhalla among whom the most honored names were those of sedgwick and wadsworth the officers under lee were equally able and experienced longstreet who was taken all round the best subordinate soldier in the confederacy ewell who was always active and trustworthy a p hill who possessed the fullest confidence of his superiors commanded the three infantry corps the cavalry was under the charge of that gay and gallant trooper jeb stuart so soon to go down to a soldier's grave divisions and brigades were led by the men whose courage and conduct had been shown in every field from charleston to susquehanna gordon edward johnson rhodes ramser heth hampton and the young lees on both sides there was the best manhood the brightest intelligence the nation could furnish both sides were equally ready to shed their blood in fair quarrel the wearers of the blue and gray looked with some eagerness to the fading patches of snow on the summits of the blue ridge which they knew would be the signal of firm roads and marching orders and few imagined what a flight of warlike ghosts would rise indignant from those vernal fields and forests on the first days of the opening may on the last day of april the president sent this letter to general grant not expecting to see you again before the spring campaign opens i wish to express in this way my entire satisfaction with what you have done up to this time so far as i understand it the particulars of your plan i neither know nor seek to know you are vigilant and self-reliant and pleased with this i wish not to obtrude any constraints or restraints upon you while i am very anxious that any great disaster or capture of our men in great numbers shall be avoided i know these points are less likely to escape your attention than they would be mine if there is anything wanting which it is within my power to give do not fail to let me know it and now with a brave army and a just cause may god sustain you grant who in general seems to have cared little for such things was touched by the generous feeling of the president's letter and answered the next day with unaccustomed warmth of expression your very kind letter of yesterday just received the confidence you express for the future and satisfaction with the past in my military administration is acknowledged with pride it will be my earnest endeavor that you and the country shall not be disappointed from my first entrance into the volunteer service of the country to the present day i have never had cause of complaint have never expressed or implied a complaint against the administration or the secretary of war for throwing any embarrassment in the way of my vigorously prosecuting what appeared to me my duty indeed since the promotion which placed me in command of all the armies and in view of the great responsibility and importance of success i have been astonished at the readiness with which everything asked for has been yielded without even an explanation being asked should my success be less than i desire and expect the least i can say is the fault is not with you we find in the tone of this letter an augury of ultimate victory however long it might be delayed contrast it for an instant with the spirit of those whimpering epistles which mcclellan sent back at every halting place between the potomac and the james his constant complaint that he was not supported his fantastic exaggeration of the enemy's numbers his persistent understatement of his own he had been treated as well as grant had been he outnumbered his adversary more than two to one he had as good an army as grant johnston had no better than lee so far as intellect and knowledge of a soldier's business were in question there had been no change for the better on either side lee was as able as johnston grant was far from being so accomplished and officer as mcclellan but the incalculable change that had now come to the army of the potomac was in the will and temperament of the man who was henceforth to lead it with whatever errors or imperfections at least with manly and invincible energy through unimaginable toil and slaughter to victory and peace promptly at the time appointed soon after midnight on the fourth of may the army of the potomac started on its final march to richmond sheridan with two cavalry divisions 
led the two vast columns of infantry torbert with another division guarding the rear in the darkness of the night five bridges were thrown across the rapidan which was two hundred feet wide hancock crossed at eli's ford and moved out to the familiar battlefield of chancellorsville warren took the fifth corps over at germana ford and marched out to the wilderness tavern where his road crossed the turnpike which runs from orange to fredericksburg parallel to the plank road between the same points a mile or more to the south the cavalry threw out reconnaissances in every direction to left and right to front and even to the rear hancock reached chancellorsville at ten in the morning and warren who had further to march established himself at the tavern at two both corps had made a good day's march and it was not thought expedient to push them further until the great trains should come up grant like hooker the year before had made the first stage of his momentous journey with perfect success another day would bring him through the tangled and gloomy wilderness into the more open ground which lay to the south and west of it it is idle to conjecture what he would have done if he had made that march unmolested for neither then nor ever after was he to traverse that ill-famed wood though rivers of fraternal blood were to flow in the effort to penetrate its eastern salvage hancock and warren were ordered to move forward the next morning the one to shady grove the other to parker's store sedgwick to march to wilderness tavern and burnside who was already moving with the greatest celerity from manassas was ordered to continue by forced marches until he joined the rest of the army but rapidly as grant was moving lee was deciding and acting with equal energy he has left behind him no statement of the theories or motives which governed his action on this occasion and general grant may possibly be right in claiming that his movement was a surprise to the confederate general but the moment his signal officers informed him of the movement of the army of the potomac to his right he acted with a decision and swiftness to which we find no parallel in his history realizing that the wilderness was in itself an entrenchment to him he launched his two army corps ewell along the turnpike and hill on the plank road with such dispatch that by nightfall on the fourth they were halfway through the wilderness ready to strike in the morning at the right flank of their moving enemy a staff officer of general lee says he was full of buoyant confidence at breakfast on the morning of the fifth expressing his gratification that his new adversary had put himself exactly in hooker's predicament he relied upon the friendly aid of the thickets of the wilderness to repeat and surpass his success at chancellorsville his confidence communicated itself to his command and ewell moved down the pike in high spirits taking care not to get too far in advance of hill on the plank road and both of them being warned not to bring on a general engagement until longstreet who was hurrying up from gordonsville should arrive ewell's force came into collision with warren's advance early in the morning and meade at once ordered the fifth corps to attack and sent word to hancock to hold his troops where they were at todd's tavern until further developments sedgwick was directed to go in on warren's right in this manner began the mutual slaughter of the wilderness on a scene the strangest ever chosen by man or by destiny for the field of a great battle the primeval forest had been cut away in former years to serve the needs of mines and furnaces in the neighborhood those industries had declined and perished and now the whole region left to itself had been covered with a wild and shaggy growth of scrub oak dwarf pines and hazel thicket woven together by trailing vines and briars into this dense jungle the troops of warren plunged and were instantly lost to sight of their commanders and of each other they fought under terrible disadvantages deprived of the view of their comrades to the left and right not knowing what obstacles or dangers would confront them at every step they made through the dismal chaparral on the other hand the confederates being in position had every advantage of this strange situation unseen and silent they could await the approach of the federal troops whose every movement was betrayed by the noise of their march and could thus deliver the first and most murderous volley but in spite of these disadvantages warren's troops under griffin went gallantly forward on the turnpike and drove parts of ewell's corps back in confusion the confederate general john m jones was killed at this point endeavoring to rally his troops early's division was brought forward however and the national advance was checked general wadsworth pushing his way forward on griffin's left with no guide through the dense break but a compass mistook his direction and wheeling too far to the right exposed his left wing to a withering fire from the enemy's front 
his veteran troops fell back without orders crawford's division though fighting hard became isolated and was drawn back and nearly the whole line was forced to give ground neither party on account of the nature of the country could follow up these momentary successes on each side the soldiers hastily entrenched themselves in every position they assumed there could be no ensemble in such a fight a series of detached and sanguinary skirmishes took place all day between the forces of warren and ewell and sedgwick's sixth corps coming up in the afternoon made a lodgment on the extreme right after a sharp fight in which the confederate general leroy a stafford was killed on the left general getty had established himself on the orange plank road at the crossing of the brock road and his skirmishers having become engaged with the advance of hill's corps he entrenched and waited for hancock hill knowing that longstreet was on the way to his relief proceeded with great caution hancock riding at full speed arrived in person at getty's position about noon and within two hours some of his troops came up and were put in position burney on the right then mott and gibbon barlow remained on the left of the line where in one of the rare clearings of the forest the artillery was posted as getty had informed hancock as soon as he arrived that an attack from hill might momentarily be expected hancock ordered breastworks to be thrown up all along his line which with the marvellous dexterity the troops had acquired was a matter of minutes between four and five o'clock getty advanced to the attack under orders from general meade hancock sent burney in on his right and mott on his left and a savage fight instantly ensued the musketry hancock says was continuous and deadly along the entire line his troops guided by little more than their own valiant hearts pushed steadily through the dismal wood and the treacherous bogs in front of them and though decimated by the bullets of unseen enemies in the jungle they made their way inch by inch driving hill's troops everywhere before them until upon the gloom of the wilderness settled the deeper darkness of night an hour more of daylight says humphreys and he hill would have been driven from the field hancock's losses were of course severe general alexander hayes one of his best officers was killed getty and colonel samuel s carroll though grievously wounded refused to leave the fight wadsworth was sent to take part in this action and forced his way as far as he could through the forest not far enough however to connect with hancock wilson with his cavalry division was at the same time hotly engaged with a force under rosser at todd's tavern being reinforced by gregg they drove the confederates over corbin's bridge and beyond at the close of this laborious but indecisive day general grant feeling the necessity of getting the first blow at the enemy before longstreet should arrive ordered me to prepare an assault on the left for half past four in the morning general meade in consideration of the exhaustion of the troops suggested a later hour and five o'clock was adopted burnside was ordered to be on the road at two o'clock so as to come to the front and participate in the advance at dawn his presence was greatly needed in the gap between warren and hancock the fighting began at five o'clock on both wings wright of sedgwick's corps attacked the works on ewell's left with great vigor but was repulsed warren was also unsuccessful in his attempt on the entrenched lines in his front better success at first attended hancock he could not know by what road longstreet would approach and did not think best therefore to bring his whole force into action on his front barrow's fine division was detained on the extreme left to guard against an approach from that direction and several times during the day hancock's attention was directed to his left by false alarms but in spite of this his attack along the plank road was made with prodigious energy and skill and aided by wadsworth on the right he came near destroying lee's right wing after desperate fighting the confederate line was broken at all points and driven more than a mile in confusion through the forest General Grant thought afterwards that if the nature of the ground could have permitted Hancock to see the rout of his enemy and to take advantage of it, Lee could not have recovered himself. Confederate accounts do not vary far from this. Colonel Venable of Lee's staff says, The danger was great, and General Lee sent his trusted adjunct, Colonel W. H. Taylor, back to Parker's door to get the trains ready for a movement to the rear. But Hancock's ranks were so torn and disordered by the fierce charge through the chaparral that they were compelled to halt to adjust their formations, and before this could be accomplished Longstreet arrived, a tower of strength in himself, not to speak of his fresh battalions. The fruit of the morning's work, which had begun so well, could not be gathered. 
general burnside's progress through the matted undergrowth of the woods was toilsome and slow although his corps did good service in the afternoon he came into position too late to assist in the morning's advance hancock's left which was waiting for an attack from the left was of little help to the main body on the turnpike and when a little before noon longstreet advanced in two columns which struck Burney's tired troops in front and flank at the same moment, they were unable to hold the ground they had gained. In spite of the conspicuous bravery of Hancock and his utmost efforts to rally his troops, in spite of the devotion of General Wadsworth, who fell in front of his command, his gray hairs crimsoned with his blood, the whole line was forced back to the entrenchments they had left in the morning. Longstreet was advancing, intent upon seizing the Brock Road, when an accident occurred like that which brought Stonewall Jackson to his death a year before in the same forest. Longstreet was riding with his staff down the plank road, in company with General Micah Jenkins, who commanded the brigade in advance. They were mistaken for Federal cavalry by some of his own men who had come in on Burney's left, and a volley from the bushes killed Jenkins and severely wounded Longstreet. Again, by the same curious fatality, did Lee's right arm fall shattered by his side. The Confederate advance was checked. Hancock, now safe behind his entrenchments, sent a brigade under Colonel Daniel Leisure to sweep along his whole front, from left to right, combing the woods for the enemy. He met with only a few, who fell back without fighting. General Grant, not in the least dismayed by his ill fortune, at three o'clock ordered another advance on the enemy at six, but in this he was anticipated by Lee, who directed in person a furious attack on Hancock, shortly after four. This was repulsed after heavy fighting in which the woods and part of the breastworks took fire. The enemy gained no advantage anywhere, except for a moment at a point where some of Jenkins' men, eager to avenge their fallen general, rushing through the flames, seized a part of the burning works, from which, however, they were speedily driven by Colonel Carroll. The day closed with an attack by General John B. Gordon of Early's division upon the Union right, where the brigades of generals shaler and seymour were thrown into some confusion losing several hundred prisoners the two generals being among the number exaggerated rumors of this mishap soon spread through the army and it may be said survived long afterwards general wright however immediately restored order withdrawing his lines somewhat and early seeing only the confusion of his own troops was more anxious to secure himself than to pursue it was not until the next morning that he discovered the ground he had gained on the morning of the seventh a profound silence brooded over the desolate space between the two armies neither appeared in the humor to renew the struggle each had suffered frightfully more desperate fighting says grant has not been witnessed on this continent than that of the fifth and sixth of may the national pickets and skirmishers were pushed forward all along the front they found the enemy everywhere retired behind his trenches a strong reconnaissance ordered by meade about noon had no effect in bringing him out an assault by the Union Army on the Confederate works was needless and injudicious. At half-past six in the morning Grant drew up his orders for the march by the left flank to Spotsylvania. The reasons he gives for this movement are, one, the apprehension that Lee might hastily retire upon Richmond and crush Butler, who, according to news received that day, had reached City Point. Two, the hope that by a swift movement he might get between Richmond and Lee, and thus secure a battle on more open ground. He was not without hope that Lee might attack again in the afternoon, but each side had apparently experienced enough of the other's entrenchments, and the afternoon wore away in quiet. The only serious fighting this day was at Todd's Tavern, where Sheridan attacked the entire cavalry force of Stuart, and inflicted upon him a severe defeat, driving him a long distance on the Spotsylvania and Catharpin roads. The trains were set in motion about three o'clock, and the army began its flank movement soon after dark but General Lee had observed the movement of the trains in the afternoon, and not being certain whether Grant was moving to the left or falling back to Fredericksburg, he ordered Longstreet's corps, now under command of R. H. Anderson, to march to Spotsylvania in the morning to operate on the right flank of his enemy. Anderson transcended his orders, with a success due partly to accident and partly to his excess of zeal. Finding the woods in his route on fire, and no suitable place to Bouviac, he pushed to Spotsylvania during the night, and thus it came about that Warren's corps arriving in the neighborhood of the courthouse the next morning, after a laborious march which had been delayed as much by the difficulties of the road as by the Confederate cavalry, 
found themselves confronted by Longstreet's veteran corps in position. Both generals were grievously disappointed, for Grant had hoped to pass beyond Spotsylvania in his night march, and Lee, who on the evening before had seen nothing to convince him that Grant was retiring, had changed his mind completely on the morning of the 8th and telegraphed exultantly to Richmond, the enemy has abandoned his position and is moving toward Fredericksburg. This army is in motion on his right flank, and our advance is now at Spotsylvania Courthouse. His delusion was further shown by his ordering early to pursue by the Brock Road, which he imagined entirely clear, a route which early at once found impossible, and which, he says, would have led him through Grant's entire army. Yet, so strange are the chances of war, this flagrant error inured to Lee's advantage. He had succeeded, favored by his own mistake and a fortunate disobedience of orders in his lieutenant, in placing himself squarely across the path of the Army of the Potomac. The sanguinary work of the wilderness was all to be done over again. Lee's position at Spotsylvania was even stronger than his former one. The country was more undulating, there were more accidents of terrain to be taken advantage of, and he employed the precious hours while the Army of the Potomac was coming up to turn every hill and knoll about the place into an almost impregnable fortress. Lee, when he found that Grant was not on the way to the rear, attempted no offensive movement, and during two days Grant occupied himself in bringing his army into position in front of the Confederate works, and preparing for the desperate struggle he saw before him. To free himself from annoyance from Lee's cavalry, he ordered Sheridan to cut loose from the Army of the Potomac, to go south by the rebel right flank, so as to draw after him the Confederate mount of force, to do all the harm possible to the railroads and stores in Lee's rear, and then to communicate with Butler on the James, replenish his supplies, and rejoin Grant by whatever road should at the time seem practicable. Early on the morning of the ninth, Sheridan rode away on the most formidable and important cavalry expedition of the war. He soon got past the right flank of Lee's infantry, and drew after him, as was intended, the main body of the rebel horse. Custer's brigade went to Beaver Dam Station, on the Virginia Central Road, of which he destroyed ten miles, a large amount of rolling stock and supplies, and recaptured some four hundred Union prisoners who were on the way to Richmond. Sheridan himself crossed the South Anna at Ground Squirrel Bridge on the 10th, and the next day pushed on towards Richmond. Jeb Stuart, by that time seeing the folly of the stern chase, had by desperate riding made a detour, and succeeded in concentrating a great part of his forces at the Yellow Tavern, on the Brook Pike, six miles due north of the city. Sheridan promptly attacked him, Merritt, Wilson, and Custer leading the assault with equal gallantry and success, while Gregg defeated an attack made by James B. Gordon upon Sheridan's rear. This was one of the fiercest cavalry fights of the war, and one of the most important in results. Stuart and Gordon were killed, and the Confederate horse were so roughly handled that they never again met the National Cavalry on equal terms. Sheridan, pursuing Fitzhugh Lee's division towards Richmond, passed through the outer line of fortifications, and in his own opinion might have entered the city, but rightly judging that he could not sustain himself there with cavalry alone, he recrossed to the north side of the Chickahominy, and after another brisk engagement with a force which made a sortie from the Confederate works, he made his way to the James, where General Butler supplied his wants. He remained there for three days, and then started on the 17th to rejoin Grant, which he succeeded in doing without further adventures, on the 24th of May. End of chapter 14